I know this person's name is John. That is the extent of what I know. I am John with the site Digital Foundry. So oh, great, great. Yes, I that and that is exactly who that voice is. Yes. Oh, great. So, yeah. I didn't I didn't know you were going to be on. This is awesome. I, I'm a big fan of the retro stuff. Yeah, Brandon reached out this week and was like, "Come on in." So why not? It sounds like fun. I mean, usually I hate our guests, but this is <laughs> oh well. <laughs> <laughs> this time it's about justice. I've combined Luppy and Luppy into one word. Luppy Luppy. Oh, no. This is episode 188 of the Insert Credit Show, a relentlessly paced audio program where a panel of video game experts must expound upon a series of chosen video game topics for no more than six minutes each or face the consequences of a horrible buzzer. I'm Alex Jaffe, and my favorite footstep sound effect in a video game is when you walk through the Temple of Time in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Well, hello, uh, I'm Frank Cifaldi, and, uh, oh, my favorite footstep sound effect in a video game. Oh, not just any sound effect. God, I don't know. Who knows this <laughs> stuff? Who, who keeps an encyclopedia of that in their heads, Jaffe? You're looking at him. I, I really like, in general, the footsteps in the Metal Gear Solid series. I don't know if I have, I, I guess, like, the metal clanking one uh, in, like, two or something. That's a good one. See, you got there. All right. Have more faith in yourself, Frank. Thank you. You're right. I'm Brandon Sheffield, and I do have uh, a list of these in my head because I have misophonia, and footsteps are among the top worst video game sounds for me. Wait, really? I thought I thought misophonia was just, like, mouth sound. It's not only mouth sounds. It's, it's like, any kind of uh, wet or squelching sounds as well. Also, repetitive sounds. Wow. So, for example, in the game... East Origins on PS2. The original game, there were no footfalls. You didn't hear the footsteps. And in this game, in this remake, it's just doot, 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 constantly for the entire game. And it drives me insane. And I can't play it. So my favorite uh, footstep sound in game is none. If it uses none, then that's the best. You know, that's a valid answer, but uh, we may have one more here because we do have a guest this week, uh, Digital Foundry and DF Retro's John Linneman. Hello, gentlemen. How's it going? Uh, good, John. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> so I, I thought about this, and I do have a very um, particular answer. The game Thief, The Dark Project from 1998. Yeah. Uh, the footstep sound in that, specifically when used with an EAX sound card of that era, uh, I found that r- <laughs> rather memorable. You really get the nice, uh, the ambient echo of walking through those empty, wet hallways, uh, which I suspect Brandon may not enjoy, actually. <laughs> yeah. But for me, it was great. It, it added a lot <laughs> to the experience. That's exactly the kind of quality content I'm talking about. So... We did not inform you of this ahead of time, John, but all of these episodes are meticulously scored based on how good your answers are. Right now you're in the lead, but Brandon happened to win last week's episode, which means he gets the distinction of picking a question for this week's show. Brandon, do you have something prepared? I do. It's kind of an interesting one. I'll be the judge of that, Brandon. Uh (laughs) That's right. So, friend of the show, Milo, is... Uh, trying to open a business with his partner, and they're going to try to make w- well it, what they initially bid as a arcade cafe. Yeah, it's arcade machines, and there's food, and it's a cafe. And so I, I was, uh, you know, talking to them about this for a while, and you know, I came to the conclusion personally that it's really difficult to get the audience you want in an arcade that's like open during the day, but it's also sort of a cafe. Like, cafe and arcade have different vibes. The reason arcades work is because they're both noisy, and they both are kind of boisterous places. But he he wants to do something that's, like, more of a chill-out space, but also is arcade stuff, so you might have to lean further into, like, the restaurant side of things. Anyway, my question is, what would be a good setup for this? Food and drink, you know, like, wine and beer will be there, but not being nightlife-oriented while also having arcade stuff, while not completely separating them into different spaces? And then what would be a good name for such a business? Well, first of all, I want to congratulate Milo, who's obviously come a very long way since that failed Peter Molyneux demo. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, has has moved on from Otis (laughs) and is now 
in the <laughs> restaurant business. If I knew how to have a successful business, I would. Sure. So I'm going to start with that. Yeah. Um, so let's just lay that ground rule there. Don't listen to me. But I also just, I feel like what they're describing is just a diner in the 80s. You know, like uh, like there just used to be arcade machines everywhere. Yeah. I would imagine that's no longer the case on purpose. I've seen a lot of places just around here in Oakland that are just like, I mean, just right here by uh, the VGHF office, there's you know, a coffee shop that has like three pinball machines and a couple arcade games and no one's ever in there. You know, I don't I don't know that it's if that's just a lack of awareness or if it's just not something people want. Yeah, I think that's one of my concerns here is that catering to the daytime crowd. Right. The only kind of people you can get are like capital G gamers that are, you know, at home and free during the day. No, what you're getting is not going to be gamers. Gamers don't care about arcade games, but you're going to get like the pinhead. You know, like like pinball is what you want to focus on. No one cares about the video. And there are dedicated pinball people who go seek out the pinball machines everywhere. The problem is that they're probably not going to be upsold on your food or whatever. They're just there to slowly put quarters in this machine. And... Right. That's the problem with pinball. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I should mention, though, that one critical factor is this is in Monterey. Mm. It is two mm. things. One is a tourist <laughs> destination of a sort. Okay. And the other thing is there's nothing else like it for like 30 miles in any direction. Uh, here's what you do to uh, soften the vibes of the uh, harsh arcade music. Uh, what you do is you take some of those YouTube music accounts, like uh, Insane in the Rain, who do like smooth jazz covers of video game soundtracks, and just swap in the uh, sound chip for just all of those. And you're left with a gentler version of the original arcade soundtrack. Kind of sounds like a lot of work, in my opinion. Yeah, well, that's how you get money. This is a weird idea, I think, because you're right. Like, people go to an arcade to, to be loud and boisterous and have fun. And, you know, so that's why the barcade works. But for, like, a more peaceful restaurant experience where you just want to sit down and enjoy your food, uh, what about something like, you know, bring back the, the cocktail-style cabinet, but sort of built into the table, maybe with that sort of Microsoft used to have the surface table, if you recall. Mm -hmm. uh so, like, the entire table itself is, like, a screen, so to speak. And they maybe have, like, a speaker that's one of those downward targeted speakers that sort of, like, only fires sound directly into a small vicinity around the table. So you pop into your booth, you sit down, the entire table is a giant screen, uh, but, you know, waterproof and everything. Uh, and there could be some kind of uh, button mechanisms, I guess, hidden along the lip under the table there that, you know, you can, mm. you could maybe, like, say... If it's a touch screen, you like grab the image on on this large table screen, and you can literally pass it around by sliding the screen to somebody else. Uh, you could browse various games included on that thing. Uh, you know, just create something that's fun and casual and kind of a discussion piece for the people trying to enjoy the dinner and the food, but also something fun to play around with. And I feel like that might be a little bit more casual uh, and different than the barcade scene, but also rather potentially expensive to implement well also you run into the problem that i think most restaurants have <laughs> in in the smartphone age which is getting people to <sighs> leave yeah yeah i also wasn't sure if you were directly referencing uh nolan bushnell's you wink company because that was exactly what he did yeah he, he, yeah i also suspect that milo's motivation is that they like arcade machines <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the idea is to share two things that he loves, like food and arcades with a wider group of people. So I think the thing is, like, we want to build out that demographic because I believe it exists. I believe that that's a place that mm. people like us could want to go, potentially. It would just have to be figured out. Can I assume the best and that they're, like, near the piers and stuff? It's in what is the, a, a burgeoning downtown district. So it's less toward the piers, but it is still high tourist traffic. Okay, then I think you just lean into the tourism thing. It's just like a bit cafe, and that's the theme of the cafe, and there's machines in there. I think that's what you do. Uh, we only ha we are at the buzzer, so for a name, I am going to suggest T-Spin, like Tetris, but T-E-A-Spin. Okay. I'm interested in making my low money, so I'm going to say 8-Bit Cafe like I just did. Fair enough. Jeez, I'm terrible with names, <laughs> but I'm thinking <laughs> like, you know, 
the whole idea of sliding the game around the table it doesn't really fit the theme, I guess, but you know, you could tie that into sliders that you eat versus sliding mm. the game around somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Could call it you wink. Slider, sliders and sliders. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sure you put a lot of thought into the name DF Retro. You just uh, initialed <laughs> your uh, parent publisher there and slapped retro the on the The secret end. is that I usually have um, the editor-in-chief handle the titles for the videos because mm. uh not great at that. It should be striders and sliders. Sliders. <laughs> striders and sliders. Striders I like and that. sliders. <laughs> it's time for one of our favorite types of questions, historical revisionism. About 20 years ago, Microsoft had a meeting with Nintendo to see if they were interested in selling their company. They were laughed out of the room. How would games be different now if Nintendo were more open to the idea? Like if, if Microsoft had purchased them? Yeah, or if there was some kind of partnership that they worked out. Hmm. I can't imagine Nintendo not being in control, you know? It's like, what if fish didn't exist? It's like, I don't know how right. to imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same problem that Sony and Nintendo had faced previously. It all comes down to, like, who has the rights to producing these the software, who gets the most royalties from it, that kind of stuff. It would have to be a deal in favor of Nintendo in a pretty big way. The only partnership I could see is that would work is, like, Microsoft sort of providing the underlying, like, operating system hardware kind of design and Nintendo mm -hmm. just focusing on the software. Yeah, that was their second proposal after they were laughed out of the room. That I can see. I can't see. I, I think one of Nintendo's tricks is that they don't overexpose their IP. Uh, I think they walk that fine line uh, very well. And so I can't see a deal where they're open to anyone else like controlling Mario. No. Because like if you give Microsoft Mario, they're just going to overdo it and people won't uh, engage with the brand as much anymore. I think I agree with John. Like that's that's the scenario I can see is that Nintendo just allows Microsoft to develop the hardware in exchange for a cut. I don't see Microsoft then getting out of software though. No. So that's a hard one to imagine. Microsoft was very experimental at that time though, which is interesting. What time is this, by the way? Twenty years ago. This was twenty years ago, right? It started twenty years ago. So this is when the Dreamcast is already powered by Windows CE. Uh, right. Uh, got right, it, got right it. on the front of the uh console <laughs> so that's that that's something i feel like that that would be the best that they could offer nintendo at that time and i think 20 years ago you could still make a case for it i don't think anybody who has used modern windows would be like let's have microsoft design th the software for this it's, yeah oh we gotta use this right. uh, it, o it only takes five minutes to search for a file in windows explorer it's uh that's really good. One thing that would happen is you'd get a lot more. You'd get Mario on the Doritos bag instead of Master Chief. Sure. Mario Mountain Dew. Mario Mountain Dew. You'd get Master Chief and Super Smash Brothers. Yeah. Master John Chief. That's right. Instead of Dead or Alive. That's true. Or you get Mario and Dead or Alive. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's just all that would happen. I, I don't think that was Master Chief in Dead or Alive. I think that was another oh, Spartan. Oh, that's right. It was a different Spartan, of course. Yeah. It's Team Ninja. You you couldn't expect anything else. We didn't want to uh, sully the brand of Master Chief by putting him in a fighting game. Yeah. <laughs> Master Chief can flip tanks. It's not really fair to put him in a fighting game. No. Yeah, I suppose not. Kirby could handle it. Kirby could handle it. You know, Kirby is canonically eight inches tall. They provide a uh, size reference in uh, the Kirby's Dreamland instruction guidebook. Uh, hmm. It shows you how tall the characters are. It's a pretty small little buddy. Kirby in fighting games is not to scale. I wonder how a Microsoft partnership would have affected handhelds, for example. Like, would they have been like, okay, Microsoft, you can develop the GBA or something like that? Hmm. The GBA would have already been finished but, yeah uh, yeah i'm thinking like gba2 i guess the biggest influence if a partnership had worked out i think where we would have seen the biggest change is with what would become the wii and the nintendo ds because those were both obvious left turns at the time into a very different style of console design that may not have occurred if this yeah. partnership had worked out because that feels like that was a response to they're moderate to lack of success with the GameCube. That may not have come to pass then. We may not have had the era of motion controls and dual screens. And having used a Microsoft Surface, I know that if they uh, developed a portable unit, it would just sound like an airplane at all times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which makes it a great pilot wing system. Yeah. Mm. Pretty good. It's authentic. Uh, yeah. Cool you down in the summer with that fan. Uh, it actually wouldn't cool you down. It's no. blowing hot air on you. But... <laughs> Heat you up in the winter? Uh, great for Super Mario Sunshine, then. Yeah, there we go. To simulate the uh, tropical climate. 
We would have had Mario on the Zune. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, the Mario. That's the answer. That's the exact answer. <laughs> We're done. That's it. <laughs> All right. Next question. What factors decide whether a game should be in first person view or third person view? Hmm. Yeah. How good that character looks. I don't know. You got they have a good hand. I think one is like, do you want there to be a dodge or a roll kind of thing? If you want people to be able to get out of the way of attacks in a quick manner, you likely need to be third person because you can't you can't really do a roll in first. I mean, you can. It's just conceptually a little odd. You you would have to remove yourself from actually being first person in order to have the roll because you don't want the camera flipping around like a like a wild child. So I think that's one of the big ones. And also whether it's Resident Evil is another factor. Mm. Whether it's Resident Evil and what decade it is. Yeah. If it's a game about, you know, looking closely at your environment, right, then that might be more of a first person. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think beyond first person shooters. I'm thinking about things like Gone Home wouldn't have worked mm -hmm. as a third person game. Yeah, where you want to look at details that are in the middle of the screen. You don't want a big character obscuring. I mean, obviously... In many cases, it's done for trickery, but like your character will be picking something up and they'll be like, oh, wow, this thing that I'm looking at is really interesting. But of course, you can't see it because their body is blocking it. Good times. I mean, I think it comes down to sort of the design of like how much spatial awareness you need and whether like if you're engaged in combat, for instance, first person shooters t tend to focus more on what's happening sort of within a more limited cone of view where third person games tend to focus more on traversal moving around a space at a higher speed while maintaining awareness of what's happening around you. That is obviously like the style of combat you're going for, plus obviously how important, say, atmosphere is to you. I mentioned Thief earlier with the, with the footsteps. They've tried both first and third person in that, and the third person sacrifices a lot of the atmosphere that you get from playing the game. So I feel like if you're going for a deeper, more atmospheric experience, first person is often sort of the best way to do it. Like, can you imagine playing uh, Amnesia or Soma or something from those guys in third person? No. I don't think it would work. It wouldn't quite work, but it's interesting that Silent Hill does work being third person. But see, that's interesting. The reason Silent Hill works, I think, especially the older ones, specifically because of the way the world is designed. Everything's segmented into rooms with loading screens between them. Yeah. It's that anticipation. So you still actually have sort of the blinders of first person on, so to speak, because you can't really see beyond whatever small piece of level that you're in. Right. And it's that, that unknown factor that contributes to it. So I think it works in third person there. A lot of those survival horror games do work for that reason, I think, because they constrain the view. As soon as you try to open it up, I think it loses a lot of atmosphere. Have you all seen the, the movie Jiu Jitsu starring Nicolas Cage? No. No. Nope. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's a movie about aliens came and taught us Jiu Jitsu so that we would fight them every eight years. Uh, and if we ever lose, I don't know if it's eight years, but whatever. Wait, is this like we Space ever, Mortal Kombat? It's kind of like Space Mortal Kombat. If we ever lose, then they kill the world. Well, okay, we don't have to win. We just have to give them a good, a good fight. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is there is a lengthy sequence which flips between first person and third person. So like you're the main fight man whose name I don't remember. And at a certain point... Like the camera is in his chest and you, all his punches and kicks are happening and he's running around and you're like, you're, you're him in his chest for some reason. But then he'll get like kicked and then he'll roll out of it and then you'll see him fighting in third person and then he'll like roll back into the camera and then it'll be first person again. It's so bizarre and the logic to it is so, um, it's hanging by such a thread that I found it very interesting. It was the most interesting part of the movie because the whole sequence, I was like, why are they doing this? <laughs> what's the point of this why is this happening you know maybe maybe there's something to doing it wrong in a strange way to kind of catch people's attention although i think in video games it's mostly done wrong by accident so that maybe maybe that's nothing but check that out give that a look for some reason that's making me uh recall the game breakdown for the original xbox by namco which was all about sort of flipping those expectations it wasn't so much about shooting it was about running around and punching dudes in first person and they put a lot of animation work into those punches and it felt unique it's the type of game you would typically have expected to be third person but uh, it worked really well right like those uh riddick games that were first person yes. brawler types mm -hmm. absolutely so break breakdown canonically in my head is is tom petty <laughs> screaming it as part of that song just fyi yeah. when i see that <laughs>
Uh, to me, it's the the music from the theme from what is it like? Uh, Beverly Hills Cop Two Breakdown Something You Busted. Remember that? You know what I'm talking I, about. I I know the Beverly Hills Cop theme. I don't know any it's other not music that one. from that it's series. Not, it's, not the, it's not the main theme, but it's yeah, not it's that in one. there. For me, I'm it's find the bit it later. in En Vogue's Never Gonna Get It where they go, and now it's time for, for a, a breakdown. breakdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All okay. right. En Vogue is much better than any video game. Yeah, I can't disagree. Old school En Vogue, not the not the weird split En Vogue of today. Yeah, that's not real. Yeah, yeah. the real En Vogue, uh, much like the real Sonic. What historical video game hardware breakthroughs are bigger deals than most people realize? Breakthroughs. So I was still thinking about breakdown, so oh. <laughs> we'll say that question again. <laughs> breakthroughs. Uh, you busted. Uh, what historical video game hardware breakthroughs are bigger deals than most people realize? Oh. Okay, that sounds like a John question to me. I mean, I'll start with something uh, that that I feel like is often underestimated. The arrival of the NVIDIA GeForce 3. Specifically, they introduced programmable pixel shaders into the hardware. At the time, it was viewed as sort of a waste of resources. It ran slow. People weren't easily convinced. But in time, who's doing games without pixel shaders at this point? So it's yeah, like yeah. one of those unsung things, you know, the average consumer maybe doesn't think about it. The word shader doesn't really mean much to them, but it's so important to the way games look these days. And I feel like it all started at that point in a way that, you know, you just don't hear a lot of people talk about anymore. What games do you think convinced people to turn around on that? Honestly, you know, so the GeForce 3 line sort of first appeared also in the Xbox hardware right around the same time. So I actually think it it was games like the original Halo, probably hmm. something like the ice, ice or the water in that game. You guys remember that stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember people being really impressed by the water at the time. Water physics were a real benchmark for video game graphics for a very long exactly. time. Exactly. It's just like the play of light off of that. I think people would see that and just sort of be dazzled by the effect. They didn't know why it looked awesome, but it was all the magic of shaders. I think that bump mapping, it's not a hardware thing. Uh, so actually, never mind. Uh, mm -hmm, <laughs> taking mm -hmm. it in a different I mean, that, direction. That is, it's tied into it though to do the operations necessary. Yeah, bump mapping was had wider reaching ramifications than I think are appreciated because, of course, in the Xbox 360 era, you know, it was kind of like magic that we could now have all of this not exactly free but much cheaper to produce detail that was on top of polygons and didn't require additional geog geography but now it's, it's used for like volumetric lighting for pixel art games like octopath traveler is using yeah. that kind of stuff for you know lighting and shadows and that's why a lot of the like modern indie games can do the, this kind of actual realistic lighting not realistic um dynamic lighting i should say and it's it's because of uh normal maps bump maps that we kind of associated with something higher fidelity but it's it's been used in other ways now so i think that's an interesting one these are all to me incremental improvements i'm going bigger here okay i'm going lockout chip mm. lockout chip was a hardware innovation Ooh. that essentially created the modern video game in i mean because before this you had these boxes that essentially were open boxes like yeah. anyone could make an atari game whatever. quaker oats made an atari game they sure did oh man that's good <laughs> there's, a, there's a there's a game about dog food, right? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> but with the introduction of the lockout chip, you now had to partner with the hardware maker to reasonably be able to sell games on the system. And that has just never changed. That was a dynamic shift that was immediately permanent and will never go away. Yeah. You know, we've talked about the death of the Dreamcast a million times, but the DVD inclusion in PS2 was certainly a factor in that. And I think that people like us talk about it, but I, I do think that DVD as a selling point for a console is is under discussed at this point. Because we we've we all got mm. tired of people trying to be like the home theater and and the one stop set top box. But they are now. Like I my you know, for nope. for a long time until I got tired of the interface, my PS4 was my Netflix box. My PS3 was my Netflix box, you know? I think those kinds of things are actually hardware sellers to a wider market than we might think about. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. I think that the PS2 DVD drive is what established the video game console as a home media box. So yeah. That's a really good answer. Man, imagine if there was a game console that also played VHS tapes. 
I'd be there. Yeah, there was almost the Nemo or whatever it was called, right? <laughs> right. It never came <laughs> yeah. to pass, but you know. Yeah, because there were VHS tape video games, like all those light gun games that were basically, they were similar to Laserdisc games. But it didn't come with the VCR, right? No. The system. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the critical difference. It'd be horrible. It would was the answer. I mean, the Nemo, I'm sure was, oh. the, the Nemo was never going to work. No. The Nemo was a all. dream. That would not have changed anything. It would just be a thing that we look back at and laugh on, like the like the Halcyon or whatever that laser disc system that had two games on it. You might say that Little Nemo was only a reality in Slumberland. Not yeah, Little indeed. Nemo, it's regular Nemo. <laughs> All right. Question five. A new restored version of the Super Mario Brothers movie was released for free on archive.org with 20 minutes of additional footage. What? What scenes do you hope to see in the Morton Jankel cut? I did not know this. Um, <laughs> oh, I, yeah, check it out. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the restoration process because it is awesome. Please. Please do. It is... Uh, oh, God, wait. What's the guy's name? He's actually uh, in my inbox right now. Garrett Gilchrist. He's the one who also did the sort of canonical restoration of the thief and the cobbler so he worked on this as well and luckily for us he also did some youtube streams of his process um so essentially someone found a rough cut of super mario brothers on vhs vhs is not a very good source for video but using a combination of that and the trailer which has like pieces of some cut scenes and stuff like that you know, he's able to like color correct from the trailer and things like that. And uh, like AI upscaling, like you ha- you would never know watching this restoration that like there's 20 minutes on here that came from a VHS tape. It's really remarkable. I want to know if Annabelle Jankel or Rocky Martin have seen this, the directors, and or and if they've given it their seal of approval. I really like this movie. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. This is the movie that I would rent from Blockbuster every time I had a friend over. I want to see... More effects shots, please, because I love them. I love all mm-hmm. of the effects that they did. But I also want an extended scene in the very clearly queer positive dance club. Mm-hmm. I want, because I felt like they were trying to do more in that zone than they were able to do because, you know, this is the Max Headroom people and they were very like, they had, they were a group of cool artists that somehow landed this Mario opportunity. So I want to see more of their like, pushing the boundaries of what Super Mario could be in there. So yeah, I I hope there's, man, 20 minutes. I'm ready for it. Yeah. I kind of feel like you're touching on something there, Brandon, in terms of like, I would like to see this vision of what they were trying to do necessarily before, you know, it became what it is, you know, more unrestricted, unrestrained without any, any potential guidance from Nintendo. Just their weird perception of what, mario brothers was at that point i don't know yeah. how, how far along in the process this these scenes were made but uh because i haven't seen it yet the the new 20 minutes of footage but yeah i, I would like to see something more like you say basically i might watch it yeah. tonight i'm excited about this i i've got the blu-ray right here in my well, hand the, the blu-ray is the main source of of the film here so uh, you yeah. can throw that blue way blu-ray away I actually have an idea about that, Brandon. What if we hosted a sort of live watch along on the Inser Credit Forums where we could all watch and comment on this movie together? Sure. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, let's set that up. From a video game perspective, not just a not a film lover's perspective, I think the most interesting part of the Super Mario Brothers movie is along the lines of what Brandon was talking about, which is that this is probably the last time that someone else had control of Mario. Other than Nintendo? This was 93. When did this, the Philips CDI stuff hit? Uh, 94 is Hotel Mario. Yeah, okay. All right. We're 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 in the same era. That's fair. Yeah, but, it's around there. Yes. But it's, it's one of the first and last times, right? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Unless for you're sure. counting like the Donkey Kong cartoon. Like it, it is a look at an alternate universe where Microsoft bought Nintendo. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. That is interesting. If Microsoft was like cool and weird. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. They're, instead of being, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that. Like, I used to say they were the least cool company, but I think that's Google now. Yeah, Google's up there for sure. Is Google less cool than Facebook? Oh no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it's yeah. but it's hard. It's a it's a toss up there. It's a tough one. I'm tossing up. I'll tell you what. <laughs> hey! there's, yeah, there's a real race for uh, who can be the worst. A race to the bottom. Yeah, we're trying. I'm almost kind of thinking though. So the Mario Brothers movie has sort of like that prison kind of sequence. 
Yes. Uh, I'm trying to imagine mm-hmm. Mario went to prison again in Super Mario Sunshine. So I feel like there's got to be some kind of connection that could have happened mm-hmm. there. You know, if mm-hmm. this had succeeded, what could have been? What could have yeah, been? That's Mario's second strike. Throwing in the joke answers at the end. So mine is, I hope that they get into the complete genealogy of how uh, their last name is Mario. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I also want to see why there is a Yoshi dinosaur and then also Goomba dinosaurs. What's What's going on with that? Give me, mm-hmm. give me the exposition. I'd like to see Mario's twin brother, Dr. Mario. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is one year after Wario was introduced in Six Golden Coins, so throw him in there. Sure. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Maybe he's maybe he's oh, background yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. Wario's back. And that's time on the first half of this episode. We'll be right back after a quick break. John, I'm curious for any of your DF retro stuff. Do you talk? Do you talk to the devs? Like in the case of um, you did that one on, on Quake and with the Saturn one and all that. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, when I get the chance, um, I'm trying to think. Like I did a couple years back was the Donkey Kong Country retrospective, mm-hmm. where I have on camera a bunch of those guys that had worked on that. You know, I, I try to get people involved when possible, but it's always a it's difficult in terms of adding to the production. Sure. Um, I don't know if it ever makes sense to revisit those guys, John, but I had Kev Bayless and David White on, on our podcast, the Video Game History Hour, and we had a really interesting discussion about clean pixels versus composite and whether that's like the oh. art that Kev intended. Oh, yeah. And yeah. we also had a really good discussion with David Wise about the music you know, quote unquote, restoration of, of his Donkey Kong Country work and whether he considers that Ooh. restoration, which he does not. Neat. That's good. That's interesting. Yeah, I, that, I, I feel like that would be a really good, like, I think you should just take what we started and run with it. I think it'd be really good DF retro content. That is a really good topic, mm. actually. Dang, yeah, because I've been, especially with the music stuff, I've been thinking a lot about that, the so-called restorations, but I I, can, I think I agree with David on this. Yeah, from, from David's perspective, like, those compressed sounds were his instruments. There is no right? cleaner version. That just was the instrument, and he composed with that compressed sound in mind. Hmm. Exactly. That's what I would have expected. Yeah, I'm finding that stuff really interesting lately because I'm I've switched almost everything over to component input for my CRT now because I was like, okay, this is probably how it was intended to be viewed, but of course, really it was intended to be more composite and blurry. Like the dithering effect. That's interesting because I, I've gotten a variety of like feedback from different developers back in the era, and it kind of just comes down to what they happen to have on their desk. Right. Absolutely, yes. I think that I think ultimately that's the answer. Yeah. Exactly. It's like in Europe and Japan. Try to figure out it, what their canvas was. Yeah. Right. There were more RGB monitors, especially over here, and also somewhat in Japan, and there was a better chance that they would be working with an RGB monitor. Whereas in the US it seems like composite and like lower grade screens were way more common. But there is no like hard and fast rule, it's just everybody had different hardware. And it kind of depends on if it was a company with a nice budget and lots of money going on, they might splash out for some really nice monitors for the developers. Otherwise, maybe not. The thing that really got me thinking about it seriously was, uh, oh, my dog is howling. (laughs) There's a a siren going by and he's got to make sure there's no lost dogs out there. Anyway, just by happenstance, I wanted to play a game and my CDX was in the shop and that's the one that has a component cable that goes i didn't have the connector for my other Uh. genesis's and so i decided to just plug my model one genesis into the composite input and i happened to put in the game warlock and Mm -hmm. warlock has a title screen where the dithering is all vertical red lines and it was absolutely clearly their intention that i would play this on composite because it looks 100 percent like transparency when you look at it through a com- composite input. And then in component, it's just red lines through a logo. Exactly. In, that's, in that's composite, super it, common is, it on... is completely transparent. And it's like, you know, I'd, I'd looked at the the sonic waterfalls and whatever other stuff that was supposed to be mm-hmm. dithered. And it all just looks like dithered stuff that, that was smudged together a little better, you know? Uh, but this was like, holy crap. This is actually like this. Really looks like transparency. It, it, let me see if I can grab it for you here. Yeah, it's it's really one of those things. I I hooked up on a second CRT. I do have a composite set up specifically for looking at this stuff because there is a. It really varies. Some games are just clearly 
designed the art is designed with that in mind where you kind of using dithering and they expect the composite video to blur it together others less so but on sega saturn i think they were really leaning on composite video initially to sort of solve the dithered transparency issue yeah and this makes me want to go back to playing some saturn games on composite which i haven't done since like i don't know 1999 or something like that because i always at least had s video you know Exactly. This is actually very close to a question I was going to ask later in the show, so we're going to keep all of this in the episode. Okay. Uh, which games do you think have suffered the most from straying from that initial use of hardware? Initial D. Is that a question? Um, well, is that like, do you mean like what games suffer the most if you're playing them on modern hardware? Yeah, that's what I mean. I think Donkey Kong Country is my immediate answer. Warlock. <laughs> that game just lo- it doesn't look right if you can actually see the definition of the pixels like it is absolutely meant to be seen you know over a composite in order to to blend the colors together to increase the palette and to give like a sense of of uh 3d viewed as raw pixels it it just kind of looks like a mess i want to go back and see some more saturn games through composite because Obviously, with the Saturn, you could have transparency, but that transparency would go through to the background layer no matter what you did. And so often there was a combination of true transparency and dithering. And I want to see how those interact in a composite environment, which I haven't looked at in so long. But I, I have a high suspicion that like some of that, maybe some even some of that 3D dithering that went on might actually look pretty transparent. Yeah, I think for, for me, I'm going with uh, an old favorite of mine. Pitfall the Mayan Adventure. Not the most beloved game, hmm. but I have a soft spot for it. I did like a couple hour long interview with the, one of the animation guys that worked on that. That game leans so heavily on dithering to create shades of brown and different colors and earthen tones that the Genesis couldn't possibly replicate. And when viewed through RGB or VN emulator, it's just a dithered mess. But when you view it through composite video... Uh, the art absolutely comes alive in a big way that really looks dramatically better, especially when combined with the feature film quality. Like anim- They were basically trying to do what Disney had done with Sega for Aladdin, but through Activision. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I feel like, especially toward the end of the Genesis' lifetime, there was so much of that. Like Eternal Champions, for example, is all... Dithering. It's super prevalent in the West, I found. Uh, Definitely. More Western games than Japanese games really lean heavily on the dithering. Yeah. Uh, or you could say anything that the craze started by Mortal Kombat for having digitized characters as well, uh, just due to the lack of colors, they often relied a lot on that. So if you play, like, say, Mortal Kombat 2 on the Genesis, it benefits a lot from composite video and helps create the illusion more that you're looking at digitized actors. Uh, where it just kind of falls apart in RGB. Yeah, if you look at Vector Man as an example. Oh, that's a really good choice. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, like in the ice scenes, there's all this, all these platforms that are created mostly from vertical lines of color. And if you play it in component or on an emulator, it really looks like that. Oh. But if you, it's so smooth in uh, composite. I, I think the ultimate answer actually might be Sega CD video playback. Uh, where mm. they leaned so heavily on composite video to help make up for the lack of colors. It starts to resemble like real life video in composite video. But when you look at that, if you try to look at those videos on an emulator or, you know, in RGB, it just absolutely turns into nonsense. It's just a pixel mess. Yeah. Um, I just posted in our Discord uh, one of my favorite recent examples of a dither before and after, which is the opening of The Adventures of Batman and Robin on the oh, Genesis. Oh, yeah. That's a good yeah. one. Oh, yeah. So that might be worth putting in the show notes or something. I also posted my we'll get them in there. my Warlock title screen, which I keep talking about. Take a look at that. It's amazing. That Warlock title screen, it just looks transparent. And it, oh, it's, yeah. oh, that's wild. It's, it's amazing. Like It looks like red transparent letters with fire behind them. But through an emulator, it's just a bunch of vertical red lines. This is what made me realize, okay, these people talking about how you should actually play games in, in composite with lower uh, fidelity input, they, they, they're not just blowing smoke. There's, <laughs> there's really something going on here. Yeah, and again, I think it just comes down to what the artist's canvas was, right? So, exactly. You know, for example, Brandon and I are working on like a digital Eclipse product or something. You know, I think it's something we would keep in mind uh, on a per game basis for yeah. sure. 
Awesome. Well, enough dithering around. It's time to head into the dirt bag. Nice. Every week, we choose one question submitted to us by our generous patrons at patreon.com slash insert credit, where you can subscribe at any level to get access to that question form. Episodes themselves one day early. One day early? Sorry. I was, one day <laughs> early. I was late. Keep that, keep that pause, please. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely will. Also, access to exclusive bonus episodes, one of which is coming up very soon. Uh, this week's question comes from Devil's Blush, who asks, who is your favorite developer of games that you aren't interested in playing? <laughs> uh, uh, who, who makes EVE Online again? Jeff Minter is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. That's a good answer, too, right? Like, I don't know if it's the game's developer, though, that makes EVE Online interesting. I think it is the players that make EVE Online interesting. Uh, I, think, I think it's the developer because they, they're, like, employing economists and they're, they're, like, really actively encouraging that kind of deep economy and all that kind of stuff. So I... I'm interested in why they would do it and what they're thinking about while doing it. So right, fair. It w- works for me. Uh, Nintendo. I'm trying to think of something that's overly <laughs> complicated. Yeah, Brandon. Brandon doesn't want to play Nintendo. Nintendo is the ultimate answer for me because I'm <laughs> I'm extremely interested in them as a developer, but I don't want to play their games that much. That's kind of the thesis here. So I'm trying to think of someone who makes games that are overly complicated maybe like honestly they're not always overly complicated but i would say will write for myself sure. uh, mm. i do not love uh the sim games sim city the sims sim ant i don't know whatever all the various games he's worked on are all brilliant and i respect them deeply uh and i find that stuff super interesting but i don't actually love to play it necessarily i mean are you kind of like me in the sense that you want a game to be an authored experience and these are more like toy boxes yes, that have yeah. game rules on them yeah exactly that's kind of what it is and the toy box aspect is extremely cool it's fascinating it's neat to see what people do with it uh but it's just not something i love i guess polyphony digital that's another one i love their uh commitment to high-end art and you know realism tempered with a little bit of simula uh, like fake simulation but i don't want to play grand uh grand turismo ever that's a really good one yeah i love arcade driving games and i i just can't play that game it's not fun. i love them yeah too i miss them. i have a lot of respect for grand turismo but i'm not a grand turismo boy oh i know if i may one other one as a full developer i would say uh ea sports uh i've always thought oh, that's where the game is in Exactly. That's right. Well, the thing the thing is, the pursuit of creating yearly installments in any sort of genre sounds daunting, and I usually respect and have a lot of interest in what these guys are doing. But I I don't I don't play those sports games, and I don't have any interest in playing them. But I like to know about their process. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I would love to go back in time and know about the team that made all the Tech Mobiles as well. Um, oh, yeah. How did they make a game that was less realistic in many ways than what the Madden games were doing, but people enjoyed it more. Like true, f- true football fans were really into the Tecmo Bowl games. So we're not sports game players here, is what? I'm no. Hearing. So no. yeah, we we respect the developers of sports games, but have no interest in them. Listen, we're real gamers. We don't play that Madden. We yeah. don't play those Sims. We okay. listen to everything but rap and country. Hmm. <laughs> That's the way the news goes. Here's my next question. As a player, when can you feel the absence of a cut feature the most? Ooh, uh, when the cutscenes don't line up. Like Final Fantasy XV, you play that game and you know that they cut all that story out because you're walking into a scene and Dragon Lady shows up and everyone's like, ah, oh, that that other thing that happened sure was something, eh? And she's like, yes, I certainly know all about that. And I'm like, who are you? Where did you come from? What is this? How did you get oh, here? Maybe you just fell asleep for 40 minutes. Yeah, maybe, maybe I did. Are you sure it's that? Or is this something that's referenced in the movie that you're supposed to watch before you play the game? Well, I, as I understand, a lot of the stuff that was in that movie was like they couldn't finish it in time for the game or whatever. It, it was like things wound up splitting apart not on purpose. I don't I don't think they wanted to hold stuff back for the movie. I think that was like a band-aid. That was mm. that was my impression of it, but I could be wrong about that. But yeah. I think I mean this is kind of a vague answer, but when it's most noticeable for me that there's been cuts is usually toward the back half of the game 
just very rushed story development tells me that they probably cut a lot of interactive content that would have gotten me there naturally. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, what are some examples? I can't think of any examples. I'm just, you're going to have to deal with me being vague. Final Fantasy 15. All right. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's a good point. I mean, like listeners, the, comment with some examples. <laughs> you know, the the like the train ride sequence, mm-hmm. the, like getting into the bad guy headquarters or whatever feels really rushed. Yeah, and then suddenly you're in this like th- three hour dungeon when you haven't had to do that before, and there's like new mechanics there. And it's like now you have this ring with powers, and it's like wh- why? <laughs> why do I have this? <laughs> um, I, one that I can think of is. And this is very specific. The original version of Dark Sector that I played oh, at a oh, um, wow, yeah, I played Dark Sector at a press event, and at the time, it was a game about a person with a glaive that they could throw and do all kinds of Zelda y things with. Like you could set it on fire, and it would light torches uh, for puzzles, and you could like fit it into things. And and it was all this like you had one main weapon. And it was used contextually for puzzles and attacking enemies. And that was what the game was going to be. And I was really excited about it because I was expecting just this grim, dark bro game. And they were like, no, actually, it's it's 3D Zelda. And I thought that was really cool. And then the game came out and I was like, where'd all that stuff go? You didn't do any of it. <laughs> it must have been too hard or, you know, somebody said no or whatever. But that the game that I played two years before it came out and the game that I played once it came out were, were very different. And a lot of the cool stuff got cut. I mean, for myself, it's it's mainly narrative driven games that feel either abrupt or as if they're just missing important information. Uh, two of the most obvious ones for me are Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver and uh, Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Ooh, I was thinking of Knights of the Old Republic too. That's another good one. Exactly. It's the same type of thing where you're put in a situation or the game just suddenly ends uh, and you're left wondering like, wait, what? What happened here? And the questions are either not answered at all or it just feels like they essentially ran out of time and money. Actually, Knights of the Old Republic 2 brings up another good one, a uh, good way to, uh, as a player, understand that content was cut is if you uh, data mine the resource files and find cut content. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not as a player, that's as a data miner. That's the ultimate game, Jaffe. <laughs> I guess it Jaffe, is. Jaffe, I was going to say you should bring this one back and give us some time to think about it, because I know there are tons of times where I've been like playing a game. And, okay, there's there's a game... Uh, I, I've mentioned this one before in um, Phantom Dust. There's a door at the bottom of the the citadel that you're in. It's closed, but it, you can tell that it's like it's not just a texture. There's like polygons there. It's a real door. And I was like, there must have been stuff that was supposed to be down there. And uh, as a player, I really felt this because there was more to this hub world than we were given it. You could just kind of feel it. And then I wound up asking Futatsugi, the director, he was like, yeah, that was going to be a whole other section, but we had to cut it because we had no time. So many things like that that are in my brain, but I just can't recall to mind. We got we to gotta bring this one back. It's a good question. All right. I'll earmark it. I'll go on to our next question then. I want to talk about video game deserts. Uh, deserts, they're in a lot of games. Uh, they often end up just being flat expanses of sand. How do you make a cool video game desert? Mm, I could tell you how we tried to do it. Because we got a please do we got a desert in oh dear one key thing was uh, a lot of you got to have a lot of good skulls bleaching in the sun that's important mm-hmm. um, you mm-hmm. need that Looney Tunes taught me that uh, another thing that you can do in and near does this as well is uh, exchange water for sand just have like instead of a waterfall you have a sand fall and instead of a, yeah. a lake you got like a sand lake like a quicksand pit that's fun i mean there's water you can in that, go fishing in the sand and you near. go fishing in the sand in near and and catch a duplodonchus i don't remember what it's called some <laughs> big old honking fish but uh the other thing that we did was to since deserts tend to be pretty you know they're th- you can either lean in to their sameness or you can try to hide it and we tried to hide it by having a lot of um mystery curves where you can't see what's behind it but we had big pyramids and stuff in the background. So you could imagine that there's like stuff where the eye can't see. So th- those, those are, were my things that I would try to do with a desert. That's kind of what I was thinking of along the lines as the mystery of it. There was a time when every game in 3D seemed to have a lot of fog to cover up the draw distance to reduce yeah. that 
Uh, oh, yeah. And that's not really a thing anymore. And I actually think there's something lost there. Being able to see always so far into the distance, it spoils a little bit of mystery. And I mm-hmm. feel like a desert is one of the few locations in a modern game that you could design where you could use like a sandstorm and various other atmospheric effects to sort of conceal what's out there. Yeah, get a mirage going. Some mystery. Get a mirage going, you know, like fluid sand, you know, so you have sparkling, blowing sand, all this kind of stuff. Like, you create some really fancy visual effects that also kind of make you wonder what's out there. Uh, but there does need to be something out there. Yeah. To satisfy the curiosity. You need a breadcrumb trail, something to pick your interest and make you actually want to see what's in the fog. Let me know if I'm misremembering here, but I believe that Uncharted 3 had a really good yeah. mirage deal going on. Um, and that desert was actually pretty cool because you were hallucinating and stuff. Yep, they did have some of that. I, th- I think something that a lot of games don't do is lean into the beauty of a desert. Ooh. There's a lot of, you know, really nicely colored, you know, cactus flowers yeah. and things like that that um, are in a real desert. Uh, mm. That And typically when you see a desert environment, it's just, you know, the endless sand dunes or whatever. But there's real natural beauty in deserts that, that I'm a fan of. Go watch Planet Earth, folks. Planet Earth 2 specifically has a oh, really yeah. good desert episode. Got down Joshua Tree. The 4K UHD version. Other thing I would say makes a good desert level is if there's a giant revolver and you could get inside of it and then it shoots yeah. you out to a different place. <laughs> I think there should be a big bus that constantly leans to the left or right i forget which one. Oh yeah that's a good thing to have in a desert yes actually yeah. traversal i think is important in a desert like using the the sand dunes if you're just going for the sand dune design as like a momentum yeah, you got to be able to slide down sand sort of dunes. trigger where you slide down the dune and then launch off the next one you know you create that and that's that's a lot of fun yeah how do we feel about quicksand i don't generally like traps um, no, unless they're very fan. well designed into the rest of the game. Like if the game is about traps, then it's cool. And otherwise it's like this again. I got to friggin' mash the button for no reason here. If you're going to do traps in the desert, you need a giant angry sun that's floating over you frowning. Oh, of course. It chases yeah. you. Actually, yeah. I, I realized I was thinking 3D here, but in 2D, I do tend to like quicksand because it's a great place to hide a cave or something like that. And it's like, oh, did you know that if you go... If you go through the cat quick sound in this place, you won't die. You'll, you'll get the secret thing. I like that stuff. Mystery. Yeah. Mystery. Mystery rules if there's something good to find at the other end. Another thing that's tough about deserts is the uh, the traversal aspect you were mentioning, John. I realize that in, you know, in a lot of deserts, similar to like uh, the problem you get with oceans and stuff, is it can be hard to portray a, a sense of speed because things get really samey. People have a tendency to just have like a big yellow orangish plane and it, it just doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere. And that can be used to good effect, but usually it's not. Yeah, that's where um, I think Journey, which had a lot of desert traversal in it, kind of worked. They used a lot of sand uh, particles, like sort of a shader effect on there to give it this sparkling look combined with the motion blur. Yeah. It really gave it this this feeling of speed uh, through the world, which was enticing. Yeah, they treated sand like soft snow almost. Yeah, exactly. I don't know too much about that. I've only seen snow twice in my life, but uh, I've I've seen it in movies. Ooh. This is the point of the show where I ask you what the blank of video games is, as in the mold of the Citizen Kane of video games, as we've been doing pretty much every week since our revival. Today, I am going to offer you two options. You get to choose one of them, depending on which one you're more comfortable with. Today, we can decide who is the Tom Brady of video games. <laughs> or who is the Guy Fieri of video game? Uh, I like Guy Fieri a lot better than Tom Brady. Same. Yeah. Do you agree, John? Okay. It's up to you. Yeah. yeah all right. We're going to Flavor Town. Okay. Flavor Town. Go to Flavor Town. Do Do we want to do um game developer as well as game character? It could be both or either, right? Yeah. Um, you have six minutes to explore. So the I think space. you can make a pitch for uh, Cliff Blazinski being <laughs> Guy Fieri of video games. He used to yeah. have bleach tips. He uh, does currently own a restaurant. He's more left-wing than you would expect. Yeah, he's easy to clown on, but a very positive guy. Right. Does occasionally put his foot in his mouth as well, and uh, has worn loud shirts in the past. So that's, that's my bid for game developer. I feel like he's got the opposite character arc, though. I feel like Guy Fieri is someone that everyone kind of made fun of and didn't like, and then... The more time went on, the more you realize, like, no, he's an okay guy, right? You know, and and I feel like Blazinski 
you know, was the video game Golden Boy, and in yeah, later, he was the Gears of War guy, right? And then in 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 later and more recent years, has you know maybe expressed some opinions that people don't like, and you know, sort of faded uh, from popularity for that reason. So I feel like he's kind of an opposite trajectory of, of Guy Fieri. He wears the sunglasses on his eyes. Mm-hmm. I guess it, it depends on where you've been looking at him, because I actually have seen the same Guy Fieri trajectory, though he still does sometimes speak about things he shouldn't be speaking about. But um, it, he has been going more in that direction, as far as I have seen. I guess my point is I can't remember people disliking Cliff Blazinski early on. Oh, I do. Maybe I just... Okay. Sure. All right. Yeah, oh, because yeah. he he was the bro gamer, and we were all like true cool gamers, and he was the frat boy who wandered into your video game town and was and was like trying to be cooler than you. It was what the perception of his was him was. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess I had a different experience because I first knew of him as just you know another idiot on the something awful forums like way back in the oh, day. Oh yeah, so. that's different. That's a good choice. Then I like that. Who else is someone who, I don't know. Like, to me, that's what Guy Fieri is. He's someone who was uh, pushed down our throats, and we didn't like him, but then as years went on, we we came to respect and and admit that he was pretty good all along. I don't know. Yeah. Like, who's a character that's like that, that, like, we came to like? Waluigi. (laughs) Did anyone dislike? Yeah, you know what? I guess when Waluigi first came out, right, everyone's like, oh, whatever, it's just lame, you know. Tangle? Lame Luigi Wario, but but he kind of came into his own, right? Yeah. Is right. Tingle something? Is that something? Uh, I don't know if anyone ever got on board with Tingle. Okay. I am thinking of Daxter from the Jack and Daxter series. People got more cool with him as the series went on. I think there was a lot of starter Pokemon uh, where you could make this argument, uh, where as su- when it's announced, everyone's like, this sucks. And then later they're like, actually. Oh, like Sobble. I love this um, uh, seal that turns into a clown. That's actually what I mm-hmm. like the most. Or whatever. We might be able to predict that someone like a Peter Molyneux might end up in this role. Like yeah. maybe someday we'll look back and go like, "No, I'm glad he was there. He was, and, and his games are great." <laughs> there are things I like about Fable too. I was trying not to bring up Peter Molyneux this episode, <laughs> but um, I did think of <laughs> him there because f- for all the clowning on him that we've done, and for all the nonsense he's talked, having Peter Molyneux in the game industry is something that I miss. I miss someone being like, we're going to blow your mind. We're going to amaze you. You're going to never, you're going to love this dog so much that you're going to kill your own dog in real life or whatever. <laughs> um, that, that's a little extreme. Look it up, folks. It was it was the, the interview in Edge magazine. That's right. Um, <laughs> it's nice to have people who dare to dream. <laughs> Peter Molling who says, kill your dog. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're missing a little of that kill your dog attitude. Yeah, I don't think Guy Fieri would ever tell you to kill your dog. No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. What about someone like, um, maybe this doesn't work, but Tomonobu Itagaki? Mm. Yeah, I don't know if he's come around, like, I feel like his opinions have stayed exactly the same, and people's feelings about him have only, like, what he's done is fade into mystery. Uh, Maybe so, but I get this feeling of what happened with Ninja Gaiden, for instance, after he left, and there's this kind of, like, yearning for what what it was under his tenure i guess and somehow i don't know that's a really difficult one yeah it's true that flavor town was better when uh when guy fury was still there and once he once he left flavor town it just wasn't the same when i think of itagaki i think of like like hideki kamiya's in this mold too just like popular heel wrestlers yeah (laughs) just like people you're really psyched to uh antagonize did did i tell this story that kamiya he was talking about his his best games of some year, and two of the games that I worked on that year were in his list, and he had severe problems with them, but he was like, of the games that I played, these four were my five best games of the year. Oh, that's cool. And I was like, <laughs> cool, thanks. You liked the games that I worked on, and then he blocked me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect interaction. Yeah, I was like, whatever. It's time to go into our lightning round. This week, we're playing product placement. I'm going to name a video game series, and you have to pitch me an ideal product placement partner for their next entry in, like, sort of Metal Gear style. So so it's, like, something that the characters will use, not just, like, an ad in a billboard. Uh, exactly. Okay. Our first game is Minecraft. Uh, cement. It's a cement partnership where mm. you, uh, yeah, you get these building blocks and they're all like DeWalt or whatever the cement brand is. 
How about just like, yeah, or Home Depot in general, right? Right, like Home Depot. Building thing, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. all like that Home Depot orange. Yeah, he, he can go buy materials from Home Depot. I don't know, how about uh, Hungry Man Dinners? Get a yeah, you gotta keep that health meter off. <laughs> yeah, is that, is that related somehow? <laughs> Resident Evil. <laughs> Resident Evil. Um, Morton Salt, you know, you got that girl with the umbrella on it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Um, mm. I was thinking of a realtor. <laughs> like you wanna you wanna buy a, a an unhaunted residence. You, you wanna come be to a us. resident. Yeah. yeah. I like Morton Salt right now. I like the salt one. I like the salt one. I yeah. think that's good. Red Dead Redemption. Jerky. It's got to be jerky, like Slim Jims or something. Uh, but they're they're called like uh, Slim James. Yeah, yeah, Slim James. <laughs> Um, was it, there's another word for slim, but they used slim a lot in the olden times, according to movies anyway. So, yeah, slim jeans. So I'm going to go for some horrible, like, masculine grooming product, like like mustache wax or something. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, which does sort of... Uh, Dandy pomade. Yeah. They, 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 they think that those olden men times are better. That's when men were men or whatever. So I think that would fit. Yeah, maybe like an old-timey Gillette product placement sure. situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you pull out your Gillette Mach 5, you know, the old-timey version. Yeah, there you go. so it's it's a Gillette Mach 5 that has a Bowie knife handle. Yeah. Yes. Street Fighter. Street Fighter. UFC. <laughs> That's dumb. I'm going to go like uh, Coca-Cola because people really remember the destructible things and put just put a couple, like, Coca-Cola machines that break when you throw people. Oh, that's good. Didn't we have to edit Coca-Cola out of Street Fighter 30th Anniversary? Uh, well, or is not it Pepsi? actual Coca-Cola, yeah. but there is a, a close enough. cola can in one of the uh, stages. Yeah. See, I, I want to go with Honda on this. You know, it's sort of oh. the bonus car. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's Pro- good. You know, and they could make it extra durable, so it's really difficult to destroy at this point. I don't know. I also, I love Hondas. I'm wearing a shirt that says Honda four times on it right, right now. So uh, Gears of War. Uh, it's got to be. It's got to be Guy Fieri's restaurant because to tie it in with. <laughs> we just established that. Yeah, it's be. fair enough. How about like a, a watchmaker of some kind. Oh, There's a lot of gears yeah, watch in there. Gears. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, Rolex. Get Rolex. That's the one watchmaker that we know on this show. Everyone. <laughs> yeah. Swiss. Timex. They don't use gears. There you go. They're digital. There you go. The Last of Us. Theostophis. Mushrooms. Some some kind of mushroom making. Because all, all, all them zombies look like mushrooms, don't they? Yeah, but I feel like that would be... Like, the, the games foster negative connotations to mushrooms. Yeah, well, that's that's accurate. Mushrooms are terrible. <laughs> well, they're a bad choice for product placement. Then. Listen, I'm trying to tank the mushroom industry here. <laughs> 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 Along similar lines, I'm going to go Del Monte. I'm going to say you find cans of Del Monte and it's like the best oh, that's food great. that's in the world. That's great. Oh, I like that. This might be a more difficult one. Dynasty Warriors. I think like uh, you could get some clothing maker that actually does like those flowing garments because I feel like people would be really into wearing them. Yeah, that's good. It's something. That's what I got. Anybody else? <laughs> Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Assassin's Creed. Someone who makes hoodies. A, ni- a knife company. Oh, like sort. Ginsu. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Kershaw. <laughs> Get a nice blade in the there. Only, <laughs> the only knife company is Ginsu. The only watch company is Roller. Yeah, Cutco. That's a second knife company. When, when he gets his hidden blade, they could zoom the cutscene on. You actually see the brand of the, the blade there. That's just fine. All right. Uh, Tomb Raider. Tom Brady. Uh, Tom Brady. <laughs> 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 Do you remember uh, on like QVC or whatever, you would see some of those uh, dumb things they'd try to sell you like, this will make the perfect French braid every time uh, if you just yeah. put all your hairs in there. So one of those, since it's called Tom Brader, um, so that you, you can tie it in with the braiding theme that the series I would go has. with like Caterpillar boots or something, some kind of work boots. Oh yeah. Oh, I, yeah. You know, I, I was going that that direction too. Like yeah, when I think REI of or something. Tomb Raider. Yeah, when I think yeah. of Tomb Raider, when I think of Lara Croft, it, it's her athleticism. So I'm thinking, yeah, her equipment specifically. Yeah, I think REI would be great because they've, they've probably got the money to do it and they're like the outdoor store of note in the US. So. There you go. And finally, Mario. Uh, well, Doritos and Mountain Dew, because Microsoft purchased them. <laughs> this is the callbacks show, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that's what the lightning round's for. I mean, I'm just trying to think of, like, you know, he doesn't really eat food. He doesn't... You could do uh, a partnership with Lego. How about, uh, how about Levi? Uh, and, like, his Ooh, his, his overalls, overalls are, are, like, really nice yeah, denim okay. from Levi. 
Yeah, like how the uh, sprites on Mario for the Super Smash Brothers games give a weird amount of detail to his genes. Yeah, exactly. You know what would rule yeah. is if um, this would have to probably be North America only, but like in a couple of years when weed is rec- uh, is that was my is, first is everywhere, <laughs> you gotta have some some Mario weed tie-ins because it would blow everyone's mind. Everyone would love it. <laughs> You know, I like that. Mario Dispensary. I'm going to change that to you. Now I'm tallying up the points, and Frank, I am afraid you have won this episode by just a hair. Why do I try? (laughs) Because of your competitive spirit. Your reward is that you get to come up with a question next week. If you want, you can steal one from Brandon, and I won't tell anybody. This is the part of the show where we all plug some stuff that we're working on, if we are so inclined, and also share some cultural recommendations for our audience. Uh, to occupy themselves until our next episode. Um, I'll just plug the um, something I've plugged before. I'll just do it again, which is um, do it. at the Video Game History Foundation, we have this unique uh, fundraising program where uh, we sell vintage video game magazines as blind box subscriptions. So every month you can get a new old random video game magazine. Um, it's very cool. We have something like 430. 60 a month that are going out right now and and it's been uh wow. it's been really good for us the amount of revenue we're generating even with like buying more magazines to keep up with demand is is like essentially paying my salary at this point uh, and allowing me to to do the charity work here so uh if that sounds fun to you it's uh, gamehistory.org forward slash shop i'm very excited you found a way to finally make this whole thing feasible <laughs> me too just turn into a magazine company yeah i got a couple things one is just generally, if you're like me and you have purchased a lot of media in the past, it's a fun thing to task yourself with actually going through and interacting with all of it in order. I've been going through my DVDs that I have purchased largely between the years of 1999 and 2010 or whatever when people bought those things. And a lot of them I bought with the intention to watch later or I got at a garage sale or whatever and I just never got around to it. And so now I'm actually going through them. And it's a pretty fun experience. And uh, I recommend stopping watching something if you don't like it, which has been a learned skill for me. I haven't been able to do that. Also, music-wise, I never talk about punk music because I don't like it that much usually, but I wanted to recommend one album, the Attitudes EP by The Brat. If anyone wants to know what kind of punk music I actually do like, it's a Chicano punk band from East LA, uh, 1980. Just be aware there's a little... Uh, racial pl- profiling in it, so there's the content warning for you. It's 1980. I was previously advised to beat on the brat with a baseball. Ah, uh, yes, that's a that's a, that's a sort of a different scenario going on there. But they're a pretty good band, uh, and you sh- you could you could check them out, give it a listen. I've just been knee deep in creating content over on Digital Foundry lately. Mm-hmm. You can just mm-hmm. recommend that retro. Check it out. Oh, there we go. So go check that out. I just finished. Uh, so we have a pretty well running patreon right now i get to do more retro content just finished a near three hour retrospective look back at the original launch of the playstation looking very closely at every single game across every region which was quite rewarding and along the same lines as of gaming rather than uh music or film or anything like that i would recommend piece of hardware if you're into playing retro games and you want to use modern equipment i used a lot of the retro tink 5x lately Mm. Uh, and that thing is pretty much the best option on the market right now for scaling retro games to a modern display. Yeah, I'll back that up. Uh, it, like it's 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 fairly pricey as these things go, but it's yeah. the one that just works. It's and really good. It's it's if if you play old games on on a modern display, you know it's probably worth actually investing in that thing. Maybe not so much if you already have a frame meister or whatever then maybe don't but if you're new to this like just get that one instead of gambling with the cheap stuff also good for content creators if you're creating videos on old video games it's a really great option for that it's very compatible with a wide range of capture cards including certain units that i use that were not compatible with the frame meister or the ussc uh, so it's definitely improved the production process there so yeah great stuff I have to say, I appreciate with the DF ref- retro stuff whenever you do um, Saturn things, because oh, I feel yeah. like there there may be only two or three people ever that have had intelligent things to say about how the Saturn works and what it does and the games that are on it and the technical innovations there. So I appreciate that. Well, thanks. I would like to recommend the concept of audiobooks. 
check your local library to see if uh, they have some kind of partnership with a lesser known app to see if you can check audiobooks out through them. They actually might. And it's kind of life changing if you're able to get into it. If you live a particular kind of lifestyle where you can't sit down and read a book, but you can listen to audio for hours at a time, audiobooks are a great and valid way to experience a lot of cool culture. I would also recommend that if you're listening to this show on any platform where you can subscribe to or review podcasts, that you engage with us in that way to keep the algorithms pushing us upwards and forwards. You can also go to patreon.com slash insert credit, where you could become a patron to submit your own questions, get our regular episodes one day early, one day early, one day early and even access monthly bonus episodes and other exclusive content. You can also join us on forums.insertcredit.com, where we'll be setting up that Super Mario Brothers movie watch along really soon. Oh yeah. And follow us on Twitter for our own personal updates and projects. The show is at Insert Credit. I'm at Alex Jaffe. Frank is at Frank Cifaldi. Brandon is at Necrosofty. And John is at Dark1x. This show is produced by Esper Quinn with music by Kurt Feldman. Once more, I'm Alex Jaffe. I'm Frank Cifaldi. I'm Brandon Sheffield. I'm John Lennon. And your game has now been saved. I feel like today is like the biannual dunk on David Cage day. I always, I love these. Yeah. yeah. That's every day here on the old insert credit show. <laughs> He's another one that we need to ban from ourselves from talking about him. And, no, and it's fun. Eventually we'll get Molly New on the show. That would be great. I think yeah. he'd probably do it. He seems pretty open to that stuff right now. Does he? That would be... I've heard him on some smaller tier uh, YouTube shows and podcasts before talking about right. various things. So I suspect you guys could get him. We should get him. I would love to hear that. The format yeah. of your show specifically is so well tuned for somebody like him. Yes. It would be. All incredible. the questions are like thought experiments and that's, that's his <laughs> right. favorite deal. That's the idea. To just be like, what if dot dot dot.